Good evening, everybody. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be able to join you at uh, Consensus uh, 2021. Uh, for those of you who are not uh, very familiar with uh, DBS, uh, we are the largest uh, bank in Southeast Asia by uh, assets. Uh, and that makes us somewhere uh, around the 50th largest bank in the world. I think what's more uh, interesting is that uh, several years ago, perhaps uh, very early in the game, uh, we embarked on a digitization agenda. And I'm actually uh, uh, quite pleased uh, that over the years, we have been recognized variously as the world's uh, best digital bank, and frankly, by many global publications as the world's best bank, uh, taking into account uh, the changes that we've been able to drive uh, in our businesses. Now, at heart of many of these changes is a shift in our DNA. Uh, we today increasingly think of ourselves as a technology company uh, offering uh, financial services and less uh, uh, as a traditional bank. And frankly, the fact that we have about twice as many engineers on our payroll as bankers uh, is perhaps testimony uh, to the shift in the nature of the company that we are. Now, over the years, we obviously spent time on many emerging technologies, uh, one of which uh, that we've grappled with extensively uh, has been the idea of um, uh, tokenized assets and frankly distributed ledger technology uh, at the back of that. And so in my comments uh, today, uh, I propose to touch on three things. Uh, first, uh, a few thoughts and reflections on this idea of tokenized assets and why we believe that uh, the time has come for, these, uh, for this asset class. Uh, second, I will uh, talk briefly perhaps about what's been going on in Singapore. It's uh, very far away for most people in this audience, uh, but there have been uh, developments at a national level which have been helpful uh, in this uh, overall regard. And finally, uh, the bulk of my comments I'll keep for the DBS agenda, how we've been thinking about uh, this uh, nature of activity in business and uh, where we have got to uh, with this. Uh, so uh, my uh, first comments with respect to tokenized assets, I chose those words carefully because quite clearly in recent times, the bulk of the hype has been around digital currencies. And while digital currencies are of course important, I think they don't grasp the scale and size of the overall uh, opportunity. Uh, both words, digital first. I think uh, digital is actually something that's been happening uh, not in recent times. It's been happening for you know, decades. Uh, if you think about the nature of money, the bulk of money today is not physical. It's not coins and currency or gold. Uh, it's moved around in bits and bytes now for the last 60, 70 years, 95, 98% of all money transfers in the world happened uh, electronically. And therefore digital perhaps doesn't capture the nature of the change uh, that is on us. Um, the second uh, thing is also currency or money. Uh, it's my view that uh, where we are today, while money is important and it of course be tokenized, uh, in reality, every asset class is going to get tokenized. Uh, and that includes whether it's physical property or paintings or, or um, uh, buildings, uh, what have you. Uh, the notion of tokenization extends well beyond uh, currency uh, as a, a medium of exchange. Now, what exactly do I mean when I talk about uh, tokenization? I really think of tokenization as having three fundamental attributes that distinguishes it from uh, mere digitization. The first of these attributes is the capacity to fractionalize uh, in, at, at, in, at immense uh, minuteness. A fractionalization already exists. We think about securitization, uh, for example, the large buildings and large property assets which are pulled together and then uh, put into smaller uh, bite-sized securities. But what fractionalization does is allows you to take these into uh, really small decimal points of ownership. Um, the second big thing with tokenization uh, is the idea that you can actually change the clearing and settlement process for tokenized assets uh, because it accompanies uh, the paradigm of uh, distributed ledgers and blockchains. And so you can think about real-time settlements and you can think about real-time settlements even across asset classes. And the third uh, paradigm uh, which facilitates tokenization uh, is really program, uh, the capacity to program. So you can take a small tokenized assets but you can build conditionality into that asset by programming the logic. And so these three attributes, extreme fractionalization, uh, instant settlement, cross-asset settlement, and uh, the capacity to program, make this idea of tokenization fundamentally a lot more powerful uh, 
uh, than pure digitization uh, of an asset uh, uh, or money, if you will. Now, the challenges and the challenges uh, come from many forms. I mean, if you really first think of um, the idea of really small fractional ownership of assets, there are legal challenges. What does owning 0.0001% of a painting really mean? What rights does it uh, uh, give you? How do you actually express those rights? So there needs to be a legal infrastructure and architecture to support some of these. Uh, the challenges are liquidity, uh, because in many cases, the actual underlying protocol creates only small bodies of users. Uh, you just don't have liquidity, you just don't have exchangeability. So you need to try and get ubiquity and liquidity and acceptability uh, overall in respect of this kind of tokenized class. So it's not been easy. And perhaps there's been one reason why, uh, even though these tokenized asset forms and cryptocurrencies have been around for some time, um, other than in the last year where they've caught public imagination, they've really not gained a lot of uh, 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 momentum um, so far. Now, it's my view, however, that we've reached tipping point. Uh, you've got to the stage where uh, people's understanding of the power of tokenization and how this can fundamentally transform the fabric of the financial system uh, has begun uh, to become a lot more apparent than it used to be. Part of the shift has come from uh, the more active role of central banks. The central banks are not only thinking about things like central bank digital currencies, but also looking at facilitating this migration to a tokenized uh, infrastructure uh, in many other ways. And so that takes me to the second part of my comments, uh, what, what's been happening in Singapore. The Monetary Authority of Singapore, which is a central bank, uh, as early as 2016, uh, pulled together a group of players, including uh, many of the banks, uh, DBS was one of the uh, forerunners, uh, in thinking about uh, creating appropriate proofs of concept and trying to figure how we could take that industry to a level where we could start uh, this migration. Uh, in 2016, uh, they launched a project called Project Ubin, uh, and the intent of the project was to create these proofs of concept. Uh, what we were able to do successfully over the next three, four years was one uh, proof of concept to tokenize the Sing dollar, uh, the Singapore dollar, uh, to use this tokenized Sing dollar to be able to affect clearing and settlement across banks in the system, uh, to then move this into a real-time uh, settlement process uh, by creating appropriate liquidity safety mechanisms we came up with three different models to be actually be able to do real-time uh, settlement uh, using this tokenized uh, sing dollar. Then further experiment by taking this uh, and to, to be able to do cross asset class settlement. So delivery versus payment uh, proof of concept. Uh, so we could take the securities uh, 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 tokens and settle them directly with the payments tokens. Uh, finally, some work with the other central banks, particularly Bank of Canada and Bank of England, uh, in trying to think about how you could extend this logic to doing cross-border settlements as well. In fact, uh, the central banks issued a report a couple of years ago talking about how the cross-border settlement uh, framework could rest on this uh, kind of uh, uh, crypto-bagged or, 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 or blockchain-bagged uh, settlement uh, system. So there's been a lot of progress over the years uh, in Singapore uh, with the centered and anchored uh, by the central bank. And that's actually been uh, very helpful in helping develop and build our thinking on what uh, uh, the opportunities in this space could be. And therefore, so at a DBS level, the third part of my comments, uh, we have taken all of this work and thinking over the years uh, and uh, been able to launch a series of uh, different business prospects, business opportunities uh, over the past few months. Uh, the three in particular that I will spend some time talking about. Uh, late last year, we announced the launch of the DBS Digital Exchange. Um, earlier this month, uh, we announced uh, in partnership uh, with uh, JP Morgan and uh, uh, Temasek, a technology company called Partior, which is focused on creating a new settlement mechanism or platform for cross-border settlement using uh, some of these uh, technologies. So uh, Siriatim, the first of these, the digital exchange. So what exactly does the DBS digital exchange do or seek to offer? Uh, at its heart, the capabilities that we have, our services that we offer are three. One is the uh, capability to tokenize assets and provide a listing platform. Uh, this in turn then allows companies to be able to tokenize whether it's fixed income or equities or other financial assets but theoretically other non-financial assets as well and properties and asset class that we hope to be able to do very soon. Uh, in doing that, companies can not only tokenize, but they can use our listing capabilities to list this uh, tokenized. So it's like an ICO or a securities token uh, offering. Uh, 
Uh, second, it offers a service to be able to trade crypto assets. Uh, we launched in particular with being able to trade four fiat currencies and four crypto coins, uh, Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, uh, Ether, and uh, XRL. And on the other side, uh, a Sing dollar, Hong Kong dollar, the US dollar, and the Japan. The capacity to be able to trade these crypto assets. And finally, the third part of the service is a digital custody capability to be able to obviously uh, customize uh, crypto assets, the, the cryptographic keys, uh, and to do this with the safety and security of a bank and bank architecture. Uh, the exchange itself has approval from the central bank as a registered uh, market operator. Uh, we think that the possibilities that this brings uh, to the market uh, are actually quite immense. And uh, we think our offering is somewhat uh, distinctive. Partly, obviously, parts of it are regulated by the central bank. Uh, but it levers on many of the strengths that DBS has as a bank. So on the front side of the business, the capacity to be able to originate deals comes from a fairly robust investment banking uh, capability in this part of the world. Uh, we are in the process of um, uh, launching a fixed income uh, token, which uh, we hope to launch uh, uh, in the next couple of days. Uh, we are actively working on equity token offerings and then uh, property token offerings. Uh, because we have a strong private banking uh, franchise as well, we believe that we should be able to take these and distribute this into our accredited investor and private banking uh, universe. So that's the front end of the business. On the trading business, the crypto asset trading business, there's obviously a lot of demand for crypto asset trading, uh, again, from accredited high net worth in, uh, 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 individuals. The comfort of being able to do this uh, from a bank, which is a well-known bank, well-capitalized bank, uh, a regulated bank, we think is going to be distinctive and distinguishing. We think we're one of the first uh, major banks in the world to offer this capability. And the comfort and trust that comes from dealing with the DBS, we think is going to be helpful to bring many people who have been keen to get into these asset classes and uh, to be able to uh, dip their uh, toes into it. In fact, we just offered trust services around the crypto assets as well. And finally, on the back end of the business, the custody payments and the settlement capability. Uh, our capabilities, because they're held within the bank, uh, are run within, with the same uh, oversight mechanisms and governance mechanisms that a typical bank would need to have. So it includes the highest level of cybersecurity controls, uh, but also includes the highest levels of uh, AML and KYC controls, um, things that we do uh, naturally in the course of our payment business. Uh, this exchange is actually an accredited investor and a members only exchange. And one of the reasons for that is that we're trying to hold a high bar and making sure that the people we get in pass the standards of uh, KYC and whereas, as well as pass uh, coin purity checks, et cetera, that we need to perform to make sure that we're seen to be completely uh, as kosher uh, uh, as is possible to be. Uh, the exchange has had a good uh, start. Uh, we've been four months in business. The volumes are good. We're getting a lot of demand. We're being slow in terms of loading, bringing on clients, uh, particularly because of the KYC uh, implications, ramifications that we just uh, uh, spoke about. So that's the digital uh, uh, exchange. Uh, the second uh, service I spoke about was the uh, Partior, the technology company that we've launched with JP Morgan and Temasek to try and rethink the settlement process for cross-border transactions. Uh, the intent of this uh, uh, company is to create a network of players, uh, each of whom will effectively uh, seek to tokenize commercial banking money. Uh, so DBS will be tokenizing uh, Sing dollar, uh, JP Morgan uh, will be tokenizing the US dollar. We try to bring in partners who will tokenize other currencies, the VN, the Euro, et cetera. And on the back of these tokenized currencies, we expect to be able to create a settlement mechanism which gets over the hurdles of today's uh, hub and spoke mechanism, the store and forward mechanism. Uh, and if we can do this, then we think that this platform can be a complete game changer in the way international uh, settlements happen. Uh, as uh, we learned in our proof of concept, uh, a very powerful use case of this is not just to do the cross-border settlement for payments, but to actually start doing um, the, the settlement across different asset classes. So the security versus payment or the, the payment versus payment, uh, delivery versus payment, all of this can be fundamentally reimagined uh, the minute you can uh, create this kind of platform and infrastructure. So in the course of this year, we expect to be able to launch the service uh, towards uh, by the end of this year. Uh, there's uh, active interest from several other banks to participate at the operating level. 
uh, companies who will be nodes on this network. Uh, and uh, we are actually quite excited about the possibilities that this presents. Uh, we're also excited because we think that this platform could have one more important use case, which is to help settle central bank digital currencies uh, across countries and across central banks. Uh, we've had some conversations in this regard with a few of the central banks and players, uh, and there is some interest in exploring how this platform could be used uh, in that capacity. Finally, uh, let me move to the third service that we uh, just uh, announced, which is the carbon um, uh, exchange. Um, it's quite clear that uh, as we go forward, sustainability is one of the biggest agendas of our time. This is going to be a trillion dollar uh, industry. And one of the biggest things that needs to happen is to actually bring uh, transparency, liquidity and integrity into the trading of carbon credits. Uh, carbon credits as a mechanism have been accepted uh, since the Kyoto Protocol was signed. Uh, but the market for carbon credit tends to be small, it's fragmented, and it's illiquid. Uh, one of the challenges in that market has been the absence of trust. Uh, and uh, obviously, that goes back to the source of the carbon credits, but also the capacity to be able to trade it and uh, create transparency and information around it. So we think this carbon uh, is a fantastic asset class to tokenize and to be able to trade at scale. The carbon exchange that we just announced in partnership with Tomasek, SGX, and Stanchart uh, seeks to do that. Put in an exchange uh, over here in Singapore that has a very high bar on carbon uh, asset quality, uh, which has really strong capacity to do verification, authentication, accreditation, uh, which uh, Envisard is bringing in global rating agencies to rate the projects and the carbon credits themselves, uh, and thus wind up creating an ecosystem of players uh, who can actually trade these uh, carbon credits at scale. Uh, given so many companies have made the net zero commitments, uh, we believe that there's uh, over the next decade going to be a dramatic explosion in the voluntary carbon market. We think it'll probably grow 10 times. It could get to be a 50 to $100 billion market in the course of this decade. And therefore the timing is right. And being able to essentially tokenize and trade these assets is going to be a significant opportunity. Uh, it will be an opportunity that will do good for the ecosystem and help companies who have an agenda for transition uh, in terms of their own uh, uh, business models and their carbon commitments. Uh, but at the same time, we think uh, it will create uh, uh, what I uh, touched on before, transparency and integrity in the asset class, and therefore create a much greater degree of trust in the marketplace uh, itself, in the asset class itself. So three different uh, opportunities that we focused on. Uh, each of them fundamentally speak to uh, where I started uh, my comments on, that we believe the time has come uh, for uh, uh, a, a huge shift uh, in the paradigm. Uh, we have hit tipping point, and we believe that in the course of the next decade, the power of uh, blockchain, the power of uh, tokenization, and the power of these technologies to rethink the fabric of the financial infrastructure, financial industry, uh, is definitely uh, on us. Uh, we're excited about uh, the prospects and the opportunities that we've so far unveiled. Uh, we continue to work on several more. And we think that along with AI and uh, machine learning and data and, uh, and based digitization, some of these activities are going to be fundamental to rethinking and reshaping not only the future of DBS, but the future of uh, the financial system and markets in days to come. Uh, thank you for your uh, attention, and I uh, look forward to catching up with uh, uh, any of you who wish to seek us out uh, bilaterally. Cheers.